Uh, let's begin with prayer. Lord, it's just so good tonight to worship you, the great I am. And as we've been studying the book of Exodus, we just are reflecting back to that first time when you appeared to Moses in the burning bush. And he said, who, am, who are you? Who, is it, who sends me? And he says, you tell them I am who I am. And Lord, you are the great I am. And even as we were singing about just enjoying your presence and having that desire like the deer pants for the water, Lord, we, we want to know you. We want to be more in your presence. And as we're going to be talking about this and seeing it lived out in Moses' life, Lord, we want it in our life. Give us a deeper passion and desire to be with you, to know you, and to live that out in our life. So bless um, this Bible study we have tonight, and we pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. So David, in Psalm 42, it was verse 1, we sang the song, As the deer pants for the water brook, so does my soul thirst after you, O God. We think of the time that David was a young shepherd boy tending his father's sheep. He, of course, would become the greatest king of, of Israel's history of all time. And yet, he was the one who penned that, and he penned so many psalms like that just to be in God's presence. Then you move to the New Testament. And you have people like Mary, you know, the sister of Martha. We have her mentioned three times in the Gospels. And in each time we see her, we see her at the feet of Jesus. She just wanted to be in the presence of her Lord. Man's highest purpose is to know God and then to be in his presence. When God placed man in the garden, man had this incredible relationship with God, always in the presence of God. And then, of course, once he fell into sin, that 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 presence, that overwhelming presence was broken. And it has been, and we see this played out through the Bible. It has been man's desire since that time to enjoy God's presence. We think of the Apostle Paul who, who uh, you know, wrote so many great verses and chapters and books in the New Testament. And his expression in Philippians 3.10 bears this out. He writes, that I may know him. That's my, my supreme desire is to know God better. By the way, that word in the original language doesn't mean to know intellectually, but to know by experience, to be in God's presence, to have fellowship with him. And so I, I know today I, I put in my Twitter um, a quote from A.W. Tozer. He said, it is not intellectual knowledge about God that quenches man's thirst, but the very person and presence of God himself. That's what satisfies, that's what fulfills the believer's life for sure. So as we come to Exodus chapter 33, Moses is expressing his heartfelt desire to know God and to experience his presence and, and to have all of God's people enjoy that. So we'll see that as we move through here. Um, very quickly, though, just to recap, remember, and this kind of sets the scene, in chapter 32, last time we saw the children of Israel worshiping a golden calf. And so Moses goes back up on the mountain and he intercedes for the people he prays that great prayer in Exodus 32, verse 32, saying, God, forgive their sin, but if not, w would you blot me out of your book of life? Anything, Lord, that your people might be forgiven and enjoy your presence. And God in his grace did forgive them. However, we're going to see that there are consequences as we begin to come to this chapter. So... Verse 1, the Lord said to Moses, depart and go up from here, you and the people whom you've brought up out of the land of Egypt, to the land which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, saying to your descendants, I will give it. And I'll send my angel before you, and I'll drive out the Canaanite, Amorite, Hittite, Perizzite, Hivite, Jebusite, termites, doesn't say that, but <laughs> go up to the land flowing with milk and honey. So God answers Moses' prayer that he had in chapter 32. He forgives the people, and he now tells them, I I'm going to take you, I'm going to lead you into the land of promise. However, as he goes, he says, I'm not going to be in your midst, though. For I will not go up in your midst. I'm going to lead you, but I won't be in your midst. Lest I consume you on the way, for you're a stiff-necked people. Isn't that interesting? See, God is so holy. He said, man, I, I don't want, I'm not going to be in their midst. There's just no way. And when the people heard this bad news, they mourned. They, no one put on their garments, which or their ornaments, which was a sign of celebration. For the Lord had said to Moses, say to the children of Israel, you're a stiff-necked people. I could come up to your midst in one moment and consume you. You want me in your midst, I'll consume you guys. Now, therefore, take off your ornaments that I may know what to do to you. 
So the children of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments at Mount Horeb. And of course, this would be all their jewelry, all their just expression of celebration. They were excited. God's forgiving us. But God says, hold on a second, man. This is not a time of celebration because of your sin. Now, Moses then, because God wouldn't be in their midst, Moses took his tent, pitched it outside of the camp, far from the camp, and he called it the tabernacle of meeting. Now, obviously, this is not the tabernacle proper that had the holiest of holies and all the different dimensions we saw, and which we'll recap, by the way, next week. But this is a tent, a small tent that he had erected that God would meet him. And it came to pass that everyone who sought the Lord went out to the tabernacle of meeting, which was outside of the camp. They'd have to now go individually to meet with Moses. So it was whenever Moses went out to the tabernacle that all the people rose and each man stood at his tent door and watched Moses until he had gone into this tabernacle. And it came to pass when Moses entered the tabernacle that a pillar of cloud descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle and the Lord talked with Moses. Now, we know what this pillar is, this cloud, because it's the same pillar of cloud that's been leading the children of Israel through the wilderness, a cloud by day, a pillar of fire at night. So this represents God's presence, God's Shekinah glory. Now, tabernacling with Moses as he's there. And we'll read that, we read here that, that God talked with Moses. Talk about a privilege. The very God who spoke Everything, all creation into existence, is speaking with Moses. Now, I've never been able to experience the audible voice of God. I do believe that God can certainly do that. But I also know that the predominant way that God has chosen to speak to us today is through his written word. Now, again, can God speak audibly? Of course he can. Um, But I see that many times people use this terminology of God speaking audibly, really kind of like a, uh, more or less like a, an intimidation, or uh, I'm more spiritual. You know, God speaks to me, you know, and I've seen these preachers, you know. I was speaking to God the other day, and that could be rather intimidating. You know, how do you argue with that? By the way, it's so subjective. How do you prove that? But many times people, you know, use that to kind of, you know, be intimidating or come across as superior, I'm open to God speaking to me audibly. I think that would be awesome that he hasn't. But I'll tell you what, I am anticipating God speaking to me every single day right out of his word. And he's faithful to do that. He speaks out of the pages of the book and he speaks to my heart. You say, well, are you trying to be super spiritual there? No, I'm reading a passage and the Holy Spirit says, that's you, Ron. You need to fix that. That's God speaking, you know? Or he'll encourage me. Hey, that was a good thing you did there, Ron. Okay, awesome, you know? But God speaks from his word. But here was this rare honor. God is speaking to Moses. And here Moses, of course, is fellowshipping with God. Now, this is interesting, and and, and that's the result. Because notice in verse 10 that all the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the tabernacle door, and all the people rose and worshiped each man in his tent door. Isn't that kind of cool? They saw Moses fellowshipping God, spending time with God, worshiping God, and they began to do the same. By the way, let me say this, this real, 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 where real worship begin, I would say, begins on our own. It's our own private time, right? In our homes, by ourselves, with God, with his word, and, and in prayer. But I think it also begins in our homes um, with our family, if we're married, with our spouses, praying with our spouses, talking about God's word with our spouse, and, and talking about that to our children. And I would say this, and I would speak to you particularly men. You set the tone, right? I mean, think about that. Here's Moses. He's setting an example. They saw Moses meeting with God, worshiping God, and they began to do it themselves. And and men, we need to remember that if we'll do that in our homes, if we'll have time alone with God, that will prompt, certainly should our spouses, though our spouses should, if they're believers, want to do that. But I'll tell you what, that becomes a great example to our our, our children. If we spend time alone with God, our children want to spend time alone with God. If they see us praying to God, they'll want to pray to God. If they see us worshiping God, our children will want to worship God. We really set the tone. And by doing this, Moses was this incredible example. And as men, we set the example. We set the tone in our homes. Now, check out this statement in verse 11. It gets better. So the Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean that, you know, 
Moses saw the face of God? No, it doesn't. How do we know that? I mean, it says it right there. It sounds like that's what he's saying, but we know that's not true. Why? Well, 1 John 4, 12 says, no one has seen God at any time. 1 Timothy 6, 6, teen. God dwells in unapproachable light whom no man has seen or can see. In fact, if you jump down to verse 20, God says to Moses, no man shall see me and live. So what's he saying? Just this, that Moses had a free and open relationship with God. It was so intimate, the communion, that there was conversation going place. It wasn't just monologue. It was dialogue. That, that Moses was able to talk to God and God to him like a person speaks to their friend. The, the expression face-to-face -face is a colloquialism. Warren Wiersbe writes, God graciously met with Moses and spoke with him face-to-face -face the way friends talk together. That's what it's communicating, which is remarkable. Sometimes we see God in the Old Testament. He's, you know, he's a God of wrath, a God of holiness and justice. He's all those things. But he also is a God who wants fellowship with man. We see it in the life of Moses. By the way, Jesus then expresses the same truth in the New Testament that we can experience. In John 15, 13, he said to his disciples and vicariously to us, greater love has no man than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. And you are my friends if you do what I command you. We could be the friends of God. Now, that's, of course... Uh, it's got a prerequisite. Am I going to walk in obedience with God? So here's Moses. He's communing with God, and he would then afterwards return to the camp. And then we read this in verse 11, the rest of it. His servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, did not depart from the tabernacle. Now, when later we're going to see in Deuteronomy chapter 34 that later on Joshua would be Moses' successor. Moses will die at the age of 120, and Joshua will be the next leader. And, and, of course, remember, uh, Moses allowed Joshua, God allowed it, Joshua to come a little bit up, further up on the mountaintop when he received the commandments. Here he's actually in the tent of me meeting with Moses. But we also read that he lingered. When Moses goes back to camp, Moses just hanging out, or Joshua's just hanging out. And I, I think this is one of the reasons why God used him to be Moses' successor. I mean, he, like Moses, was zealous to know God. He wanted to know God just as Moses wanted to know God. He wanted to linger in the presence of God, to absorb all that he can. That's a great trait. That's a great quality that God wants us to have. Jesus said in Matthew 5 and verse 6, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. They'll be filled. When you hunger for the things of God, and we even sang it in one of the songs of worship. When you hunger and thirst for the things of God, he will fill you. It's a promise by God. And I found that to be true. If I'll hunger for God, like a hungry man, you know, just, man, you know, it's like when you're just so hungry that maybe that was uh, before you came home from work tonight and you, you had a meal, or maybe you didn't have a chance for a meal. Now you're starving right now. You're just like, out of the way. You know that, that, that hunger pang? Or when you're so thirsty, God wants us to have that kind of hunger for him. And we, when we have that for him and for righteousness, he'll fill us. Jeremiah 29, 13, great verse. God says, and you will seek me and you will find me when you search for me with all of your heart. Now, moving on, we read in verse 12, then Moses said to the Lord, see, you say to me, bring up this people, but you've not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name and you've also found grace in my sight. Now, therefore, I pray, if I found grace in your sight, show me now your way that I may know you and that I may find grace in your sight. And consider this nation as your people. And he said, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. Then he said to him, if your presence does not go with us, though, do not bring us up for here. For I know then that it will be known to your people that I have found grace in your sight, except you go with us. So we shall be separate, your people and I, from all the people who are on the face of the earth. So the Lord said to Moses, I will also do this thing that you've spoken. For you have found grace in my sight. And I know you by name. So Moses has been outside of the camp enjoying God's presence on a regular basis. But he's concerned because he knows that God says, I'm going to bring you to the promised land, as we saw in the early verses. But also God said, I'm not going to go in your midst. And Mo Moses is praying, God, we need your presence to be with us and to be in our midst. And if you don't choose to do that, then Lord, then don't send us then we don't want to go into the promised land, right? 
I mean, it would be better to stay here with your presence out of the promised land than to be in the promised land that you've led us, but you're not in our midst. What a powerful truth. I mean, that's a reality. Who wants to be where God isn't? Now, we're told in Psalm 16 and verse 11, in God's presence is fullness of joy, which means there's no joy when God's presence isn't there. So Moses is saying, we need your presence. And, and he's really, Moses is expressing, just as I began tonight, saying that is really the heartfelt desire of every believer to want to experience God's presence. Psalm 84 and verse 2 says, My soul longs, yes, even faints for the courts of God. My heart and flesh cry out to God. That should be your desire. I, I know that is pretty much. I mean, are you wouldn't be here tonight in the middle of the week giving up, you know, a precious time to do nothing, to gel or whatever. So Moses says, if your present won't go with us, don't bring us up from here. However, verse 17, the Lord said to Moses, I will also do this thing that you've spoken, for you have found grace in my sight, and I know you. So God says, I'm going to grant your request. Now, that said, Moses is pretty stoked, right? He's like, hey, God answered my prayer. He's going to be with us. Woohoo! So I think I'm going to take it a little bit further and ask for something else. And he said, please show me your glory. That's pretty awesome. Now, he's already seen it. So have the children of Israel. They saw it in the plagues. They saw it in the pillar of fire at night, the cloud by day. They've seen God's glory. He's experienced it at the tent of meeting. The clouds descended upon him. He's experienced it, but he's saying, I want more of it. I think we can appreciate that. I mean, we should want more of God's glory in our life. One person said, the concern for the glory of God is the ultimate motive for Christian living. It, it should be. Everything we should be for God's glory, God's glory, God's glory. And Moses is now saying, I'd like to see that glory. Then God said, I will make my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. Now, stop right there for a moment. God, Moses says, I want to see your glory. And here's what God says. I'll make my goodness pass before you. What I want you to see is that God's goodness is inseparable from his presence. To experience God's goodness is to experience God's presence. To experience God's presence is to experience God's goodness. God himself is intrinsically good. In fact, we get our English term, good, from the term God. That's where it comes from. William Tyndale wrote this many years ago. He said, God's goodness is the root of all goodness. And our goodness, if we have any, springs out of his goodness. Psalm 73 and verse 1 says, God is good. Now, think about this. People sometimes, and we're probably guilty of doing this from time to time, we try to balance out the fact or balance out God himself by saying, God is both a God of wrath and a God of grace. We kind of, he is this and he is this. We kind of balance it out. And many think of God in those terms, that he is the ultimate, ultimate yin-yang of the universe, right? He is the ultimate good and evil. Not so. I want you to know that everything God does, everything, flows out of his goodness. Everything. For example, we, we hear someone say, well, how could a God of love Send anyone to hell. How could a God of love do that? Well, first of all, hell wasn't created for man. We read in, in Matthew chapter 25 and verse 1 that it was created for Satan and his demons. And God has gone through great lengths to keep every man from hell to the point of sending his only son to die in the place of every single individual so they don't have to go to hell. So that those who receive his son by faith can enjoy his eternal presence, right? However, think about this. If God allowed those who reject his son and do evil, if he allowed them who do that to inherit the same reward as those who are faithful, would that be just? Would that be loving? Would that be good? The answer is no. And so God, out of his goodness, gives all men an opportunity to enjoy his eternal presence. But secondly, out of his goodness, he keeps those out who don't want it. So everything, even his wrath, comes out of his goodness. So Moses says, show me your glory. And he says, well, I'll make my goodness pass before you. 
And then he says, and I'm going to proclaim the name of the Lord before me. He says, you want to see my glory? Let's talk about my name. Why is that? Because the name of God represents all that God is. See, when we talk about the name of God, we're talking about his attributes, that he is omnipotent, all-powerful. He is omniscient, all-knowing. He is omnipresent. He is everywhere. He is immutable. He is transcendent. He's also good in all these other things. So he's just letting Moses know who he is by nature by saying, well, let me declare my name. My glory is expressed in my name. By the way, the Jews knew that, right? So that they wouldn't even write the name of God down. They wouldn't say the name of God, first of all. They would say the name. They wouldn't even say the name of God. And when they wrote it in the scriptures, they would only write the consonants, Y-H-V-H. Later on, it was added the vowels so that we get our term Yahweh or Jehovah. But we can't be certain that that is the actual name. So here's what the priests did because they are the scribes, I should say, because they so revered the name of God. Every single time when writing down the scriptures, when making copies of new manuscripts, every time they come to the name of God, God's name, they would change the pen and ink and go take a mikvah, which is a, a ritual bath, changing their clothes, get, take a bath, put on new clothes, get a new pen, a new ink, and then continue writing. When they came to the name of God, they did the whole same thing over and over. Can you imagine translating a passage that has the name of God over and over again? Take weeks. But that's how they revered the name of God because his name represents who he is. So God says at the end of verse 19, I'll be gracious to whom I'll be gracious and I'll have compassion on whom I'll have compassion. And that's an expression of God's sovereignty. So Moses says, show me my, your glory. He says, well, my glory is expressed in my goodness. It's expressed in my name. It's expressed in my sovereignty. But you cannot see my face, for no man shall see me and live. 1 John 1, 5 says, God is light. In him is no darkness at all. For any sin, any darkness to come into his presence, pff, you're immediately fried, right? But God had such an intimate relationship with Moses. He says in verse 21, here is a place by me, and you shall stand on the rock, and so it shall be while my glory passes by that I'll put you in the cleft of the rock, and I'll cover you with my hand while I pass by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. So I'm just going to let you see the, the afterglory. Now this, by the way, is the passage of Scripture that inspired the hymn, Rock of Ages, Cleft for Me. Let me hide thyself in thee. That's where it comes from. So Moses is tucked in a cleft by the rock. God allows his glory to, you know, be seen, but he's covering Moses with his hand. And as his hand goes by, then God allows him to see the backside of his glory, what I would call the afterburners, right? But that was awesome in itself. Now think about this, how awesome God is, how close Moses was, and how much God allows him to see. Then consider this incredible verse in 1 Corinthians 13, 12. Paul says this, for now you and I see in a mirror dimly. The things as Christians that we see, we see glimpses of God. We see God working in people's lives, transforming lives. From time to time, we see God doing miracles. We see his creation. We see the fingerprints of God everywhere. But, but Paul's saying, but now all the things we see about God, we see in a and a mirror dimly. But when we die, we will see him face to face. Wow. Wow. We will get to see him face to face. Incredible. Incredible. All right, chapter 34. The Lord said to Moses, cut two tablets of stone like the first ones, and I'll write on these tablets the words which were on the first tablets, which you broke. Yikes. Now, remember, no retribution. We saw this last week, and not, we don't see it in the future. Why is that? Because the people had broken their covenant with God, and Moses took those covenants written stone and broke them, and God was all right with that because it symbolized what these people had done. But he did want them rewritten, so he says, Be ready in the morning, and come to the morning to the Mount Sinai, and present yourself to me there on the top of the mountain. No man shall come up with you, and let no man be seen throughout all the mountain. Let neither flocks nor herds feed before that mountain. 
So he cut two tablets of stone like the first ones. Then Moses rose early in the morning and went up to Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him. And he took in his hand the two tablets of stones. Now notice the first thing that happens though. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. So again, he wants to manifest his glory. And the first thing he does is the Lord descended in a cloud. So first you got this cloud coming. Again, that cloud had led them throughout the day. That cloud had been there with Moses in the tent of meeting. By the way, we're going to see the cloud again. We're told in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 7, when Jesus comes again, behold, he's coming in the clouds, and every eye will see him. But here God comes, descends in a cloud, and the Lord passed before him, proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord God. Merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abounding in goodness and truth. And then he goes on in verse 7, proclaiming. Now, again, we mentioned that the name of the Lord is a declaration of who he is. He says here, the Lord, the Lord God. And God now is going to begin to proclaim who he is through his attributes. He says, uh, I am merciful and gracious. Mercy is not getting what we deserve. Grace is getting or receiving what we don't deserve. And uh, the example I like to use is, you know, speeding in a car. Not that I'm in a rush to do anything like that. But it's happened. So let's say you get pulled over for a ticket and you're going only 10 miles an hour over the speed limit. That's not that fast. And you get pulled over by a police officer. He says, Mr. Andy, you've been doing 10 miles over the speed limit. Psh, you get a ticket. Psh. Justice has been served. I broke the law. Justice. But let's say he's in a good mood. He says, Mr. Hint, you were going 10 miles over the speed limit. However, I'm in a good mood today. I'm just going to give you a warning. That's mercy. I'm not getting what I deserve. I deserve the ticket, but he doesn't give it to me. That's awesome. But let's say, man, for whatever reason, he goes, you know what? Uh, Mr. Hinn, I see you've been speeding, but I've been listening to your new radio station on 95.3. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and that message you taught the other day really touched me. So I'm not giving you a ticket. In fact, I've got four tickets to the Astros game, and I'd like to give them to you. Well, no, thank you very much. Like, woohoo, right? Now, that's grace, right? I've sinned. I've done something wrong. And he's giving me something I don't even deserve. So, man. Here's God. He's merciful, which means he's full of compassion. Psalm 78, 38, God is full of compassion. He says, I'm gracious. By the way, the word gracious means to bend to an inferior. Think about that. God himself bending and forgiving to an inferior, which is us. Wow. He, he proclaims, I am long-suffering. The word means long-tempered, slow to anger. Oh, boy, the greatest expression of that is 2 Peter 3, 9. It says, the Lord is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any would perish, but all come to repentance. He also adds in verse 6 that I'm abounding in goodness and truth. We already talked about God's goodness. And then he abounds in truth. Why? Well, because, first of all, he's God. He cannot lie. Everything he does, everything he says is truthful. He adds in verse 7, keeping mercy for thousands. Again, God is merciful and forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. Wow. The most concrete evident of God's mercy, of course, is his forgiveness. Verses that we ought to be really familiar with are 1 John 1, 8. If anyone says he has no sin, he is deceived. He deceives himself. The truth isn't in him because we all sin. But the good news is this, is the next verse. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins, to cleanse us of all of our unrighteousness. That's the essential nature of God. He longs to forgive. He wants to forgive. But if a person wants to remain in that state of unforgiveness, God won't violate his righteousness. So he adds in verse 7, but by no means clearing the guilty. God will forgive those who long for forgiveness, but he will deal with those who don't. Visiting, he says, the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. Now, does this passage teach that the sins of the children, or the sins of the father, I should say, are automatically passed down to the children, to the third and fourth generation? 
In other words, those generations below them have no hope. They're automatically going to incur the punishment of their ancestors. The answer is absolutely not. If that were true, the fact is every single one of us would be caught in this horrible trap of sin for generation after generation. There's no hope. What this passage is saying is this, that the sins of the father definitely do visit the children and they will bear the same consequences of sin if they continue in that sin. However, if they repent, the cycle is broken. God longs to forgive. That's part of his very nature is what he says. God says in Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 18, come, let us reason together. Come on, let's talk about this. Listen, you're a sinner, but let me, let me tell you, though your sins are like scarlet, they could be white as snow. Though they're red as crimson, they can be white as wool. If, and here's the contingency, if you are willing and obedient, if you're willing to change and to follow me, man, total forgiveness. So Moses goes up on the mountain. God proclaims his glory again through his name. And what is Moses' response? He made haste. He bowed his head toward the earth and he worshiped. Well, that's the natural response, right? When you, you realize who God is, what he's done, you have a greater knowledge. By the way, this is why it's so good to spend time worshiping God for who he is. That's why Jesus said, when you pray, pray this way. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Hallow the name of God. By doing that, you're extolling the, the essence, the nature, the attributes of God. He becomes so big, you become so small, and you go, oh, God. Thank you that I get to know you. Thank you that I could bring requests to you, you know. Puts everything in perspective. And so here is Moses. Immediately he just worships. Oswald, Oswald Milligan said, Worship is giving to the Lord glory that is due in response to what he has revealed to us and done for us in Jesus, his son. So Moses has this sweet response. And then he adds... As he's worshiping in verse 9. Now if I found grace in your sight, O Lord, let my Lord pray, go among us. Manifest your presence. Even though we're a stiff-necked people and pardon our iniquity and take us as your inheritance. By the way, notice his pronouns here. Go among us, even though we are stiff-necked. Pardon our iniquity, our sin. Take us as your inheritance. Listen, Moses is the least of all the offenders within the nation. They're worshiping a golden calf. He's up worshiping God. Yet he says, forgive our sin. He, he associates himself with the people. He realizes he's nothing special himself, you know. And I think that's why God used him, right? Jesus said it in Matthew 18 and verse 4. Whoever humbles himself will be exalted. James 4.10 says, if you humble yourselves in the sight of God, he'll lift you up. So Moses, such a humble man. God, go with us. We've sinned. Would you forgive us? God responds in verse 10, Behold, I make a covenant before all your people. I will do marvels such as not been done in all the earth, nor in any nation. And all the people among you who are there shall see the work of the Lord, for it is an awesome thing that I will do with you. So I'm going to do awesome works. Therefore, verse 11, observe what I command you this day. Behold, I'm driving out from before you the Amorite, Canaanite, Hittite, Perizzite, Hivite, Jebusite. Take heed to yourself, lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land where you're going, lest it be a snare in your midst. But you shall destroy their altars, break their sacred pillars, cut down their wooden images. For you shall worship no other God for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. So part of God's very name and essence is he's jealous. He, he wants righteousness and truth. And that, as we talked about before, that's a holy jealousy. Just as a, a spouse, a husband has a holy jealousy for his wife, not jealous that she might do something wrong, but jealous for her purity and for her love and to protect her and so forth. He adds, lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land and you play the harlot with their gods and make sacrifice to their gods and one of them invites you to eat of his sacrifice and you take of his daughters for your sons and, play, and his daughters play the harlot with their gods and, and make your sons play the harlot with their gods. You shall make no molded gods for yourselves. And so God was very clear. Don't make any associations with him. And uh, we've talked about this in earlier studies. We'll talk about it in the future as well. 
and history plays it out as we look at the, the land of, the, of Canaan and the people that were here and as we read the scriptures, it was horrible what they did. They, uh, they sacrificed human beings. Uh, they placed their own children uh, alive on gods of fire. Um, they did horrific things. Much of their sacrifice involved licentious sexual immorality with prostitutes and just all kinds of unspeakable evils. And God says, this can't, you can't associate with this or you, you'll become like that. And of course, we know that as they now settled in the land, as we look later and over the history of Israel, they began to make alliances with them. And we look at the book of First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, even the book of Judges, and we see the downfall of the nation. Now, we're going to move to the next few verses very quickly because much of it reiterates things we've seen. And so... Uh, First of all, some, many of the commandments already mentioned. First, the feast of unleavened bread you shall keep. Seven days you shall keep unleavened bread as I command you. In the appointed time in the month of Abib, for the month of Abib you came out of Egypt. And so this is dealing with the feast of unleavened bread, which of course was associated with the Passover. Then we have the law of the firstborn. Again, we looked at all these in detail, so I'm just going to read these. Uh, all that open the win womb are mine, and every male firstborn among your livestock, whether ox or sheep, but the firstborn of a donkey you shall redeem with a lamb, and if you will not redeem him, then you shall break his neck. neck. All of the firstborn of your sons you shall redeem, and none shall appear before me empty-handed. Again, so just as he spared the firstborn when they came out of Egypt, God says the firstborn is mine. They're mine. In the law of the Sabbath, six days you shall work, but on the seventh you shall rest. In plowing time and in harvest you shall rest. And you shall observe the feast of weeks of the first fruits of the wheat harvest and the feast of ingathering at the year's end. And so the various feasts of the year. Three times in the year all of your men shall appear before the Lord, the Lord God of Israel. For I will cast out the nations before you and enlarge your borders. Neither will any man covet your land when you go up to appear before the Lord your God three times in a year. You shall not offer the blood of my sacrifice with leaven. Of course, we talked about it before, how it represents sin. Nor shall the sacrifice of the feast of the Passover be left till morning. And so that's the purity of sacrifices. The first of the first fruits of your land shall bring to the house of the Lord your God. You shall not boil a young goat in its mother's milk. We spend a lot of time on that one particular law. And again, that is why today, Jews, uh, you can't have a dairy product with a meat product. And we talked about that in detail. Then the Lord said to Moses, write these words, for according to the tenor of these words, I have made a covenant with you and with Israel. So he was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. He neither ate bread nor drank water, and he wrote on the tablets the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. So this was kind of a little recap, but there was a lot more that was written. And of course, he wrote the Ten Commandments down on these tablets. It's interesting just to note this miraculous feast. He says, no food or water for 40 days. Now, it varies on how long an individual can live without food. I don't know how long that is. Some say seven. Some say, uh, I'm sorry, actually, they, you can go 40 days, 50 days. Um, it varies. With water, though, it's like seven, nine at the most. There are different accounts. But no one goes 40 days without water. But Moses went 40 days, 40 nights, no water. And, and this was a fast where God was communing with him. So what do you have there? Well, you have a miracle, obviously, right? It's an obvious miracle. I don't have a problem that God performs miracles. I hope you don't either. I would have a problem if my God didn't perform miracles. That, I'd have a bigger problem with that, right? So 40 days, 40 nights, Moses is experiencing the presence of God in this supernatural fast. Verse 21, now it was so when Moses came down from Mount Sinai now, and the two tablets of testimony were with Moses' hands when he came down from the mountain, that Moses didn't know that the skin of his face shone while he talked with him. So when Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come near him. So again, Moses has been in communion with God, and, and God obviously was spending time with him. And, and now his face was glowing from just being in the presence of God so much and so often. Now, the only application I'm going to make here is this, is that I've never seen anything like this before, of course. But I will say this, I will say that those who spend time in the presence of God, you can see it in their face. 
I, I, would, I would definitely say that. I, I truly believe that. I mean, you could tell when someone is really walking with the Lord, man, they just have this countenance, this glow, and they're just like, man, that person knows God. They, they spend time with the Lord. And you can see the opposite of that as well, right? And there's some people that look like they've just been drinking prune, uh, uh, not prune juice, but lemon juice, right? And they just, you know, they don't seem very happy. It's like, do you know the Lord? Yes, I do. I read the word today. Really? I'm really loving church. Really? So anyway, Moses' faith literally shown. Then Moses called them to him, and Aaron, all the rulers of the congregation, returned to him, and Moses talked with them. Afterwards, the children of Israel came near, and he gave them the commandments, all that the Lord had spoken with him on Mount Sinai. Now, check out this peculiar passage in verse 33. When Moses had finished speaking with him, he put a veil on his face. That's just kind of interesting. But whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would take the veil off until he came out, and he would come out and speak to the children of Israel whatever he had been commanded. And whenever the children of Israel saw the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face shone, that Moses would put the veil on his face again until he went in to speak with him. So it appears that Moses didn't want to make a big thing of this whole thing. You know, his face is going, man, look, check it out. So, you know, he would cover himself, kind of a thing. But what's interesting is that Paul picks up this passage in 2 Corinthians and he shares a few things with us that are quite interesting. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 13, he, he speaks of the fact that Moses was putting on this veil and that the glory over a period of time was fading. And so he says, Moses put a veil over his face so that the children of Israel would not look steadily at the end of what was passing away. This glory would eventually pass away. And Paul went on to make two observations, or actually applications. And one was this. He was speaking to the children of Israel and, and, and speaking, of course, to the New Testament church. But he was saying, you know what? The old covenant has faded away. Just as the glory did from Moses' faith, and God has brought us a new and greater covenant. Speaking of the new covenant that we now have in Christ. That was the first application. The second one, he goes on to speak in verse 14, saying, For until this day, the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament, because the veil, we need to remember, is taken away in Christ. But even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil lies on their heart. So he applies that now to the heart of the Jew today, who though they read the scriptures, their heart is veiled to not see the new covenant in Jesus Christ. However, he says in the next verse, but when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. And what a great thing it is when you see a person who is a Jew and all of a sudden they begin to see, ah, Jesus is the Messiah. Well, the veil is taken away and all of a sudden they see what a glorious truth that is. So here we have this fascinating end to really two great chapters, though, that speak of the presence of God. And, and when you think about it, really, the book of Exodus begins with that. It's in Exodus chapter 3 where God actually reveals himself to Moses for the first time in the burning bush, this revelation of God's glory and presence. And now we're near the end of the book and we find the same thing. Moses is spending time in the tent of meeting. He's up on the mountaintop, you know. He's communing with God. He wants God's presence to go with his people. He was, he was fixated. He says, essentially, I want God's presence. And so I would just simply say that in closing, may we have that same passion. May we have a passion like Moses had, or even his associate Joshua had, to linger in the presence of God. And, you know, that you, you, you can't put it on. You can't fake it. You can't manufacture it. It only comes by spending time with him. And so tomorrow morning, get up a little earlier, right? It's not that hard. Is it a sacrifice? Of course it is. That's what a sacrifice is. And it sounds so crazy, but we hear those terms all, yeah, just sacrificing for God. Are you? A sacrifice is just that. It's having to give up something that's, you know, it's a little hard. That's, but that lets, that's, makes it sweet to God. Sacrifice 15 extra minutes of sleep, a half an hour, whatever it takes. Get into a pattern where you get up in the morning and you're just reading his word and you're sitting before him and you're praying. And then you can ask for that presence to linger on throughout the day. God, I need your presence here at work. Oh, how we need it at work. Man, I need it in the car when I'm driving. I need it, dear God. And you know, God gives us things to help us. That he might be a companion at work, or you could read your Bible, you know, at lunchtime. You could also be listening to Christian radio, coming and going from work. God gives us helps throughout the day so we can enjoy his presence. Worship music, 
But may that be our fixation as it was for Moses, always wanting the presence of God. It was the same for Paul. I want to know him. It was the same for Mary. I want to be at the feet of Jesus. That's the passion we need to have. And when we experience that, man, it makes life a lot easier because we have trials. We have difficulties. But man, it's so much easier when you've got the presence of God with you. So let's pray.